Hello, it's Richard from Original Outdoors, and this is an overview of my fire starting kit. So all of this is in response to a question we had on a recent course, which was looking at that client's fire starting kit and then comparing it to what I pack. And it led to what, well, what I thought was quite an interesting discussion. And I know not everybody is interested in the ins and outs of fire starting and ferro cerium rods and lighters and that kind of thing, but I know enough of you are that it's worth making a video about. So this is a kit. And I say a kit because I vary things depending on where I'm going to, how long I'm going for, what I'm doing, and possibly most importantly, whether I intend to light a fire, whether that is something I intend to do every night, every day, or have a fire running throughout the trip, if we were up here in the woods, say, or if it's an emergency item that okay, well, we're going to be cooking on stoves or eating in this place, but if we find ourselves stuck in this one place, it would be awfully good if we knew how to light a fire, had fire lighting gear with us, and could get a fire going for safety or even for survival situations in, with short notice. So this kit is either a short-term intentional fire lighting kit, so we intend to light several fires over a period of days or weeks, or it's a very comprehensive emergency fire lighting kit. In the pouch itself, well, it says fire on that, on the front of the pouch there, so that I know which one it is. I've got a couple of these small zipped pouches. Um, I just like to organize different things into different pouches, but if you find a good one, you end up buying several of them. So I've got a few of these, and this one says fire on it, so I know what it's gonna do. I've also got some orange duct tape on there and a bit of fairly bright cord. That's so that if I drop it on the forest floor or it gets hung up on a tree or it's in my shelter, I can find it. There's no point having super secret tactical items that blend into the forest floor if you need to find them. If you're doing that kind of work and you need to be hidden away and be camouflaged for whatever reason, then you can always put it inside another better camouflage bag. But my safety items are generally in orange or red or bright yellow and they're really easy to spot from a distance so that's on the outside and inside there's not a great deal um when i go through the contents on this what you'll notice i don't have in here is any natural tinder i don't have any fat wood i don't have any birch bark or little daldinia concentrica cramp ball fungus or coal fungus or chaga or anything like that that's because for me if i'm bringing things with me from home out into the woods into the mountains or out on trips on expeditions when we get to go and do those kind of things overseas again i'm not looking to bring natural scavenged foraged items from home put them inside a plastic bag and then take them off to the woods somewhere what i'm looking to do is find the best, most efficient way of making a fire in that environment in a way that I can repeat, that will work in all sorts of circumstances and that I know I can rely on. I'm not trying to replicate here the skills of a 19th century mountain man. I'm not trying to replicate the skills and equipment of an 18th or 17th century Highlander. Other people do that much, much better and I watch their videos and I talk to them and I read their stuff. It's fascinating, but that's not what I'm doing when I'm going out on trips. And generally it's not what I'm doing when I'm going out with clients. What I'm trying to do is make fire reliably and repeatedly, 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 doing it again and again in the same place in different conditions so that it's less of a question mark. I do practice those other skills from time to time and we teach them on the courses and you can come here and learn how to do bow drill from start to finish and which one of these trees around here has the best tinder growing on the side of it and where to find the honeysuckle bark down there, how to process it, all of these little things. But that's not what's in this kit. If I'm going out, say for a two week trip and I intend to be lighting a fire for half of those nights, then from day one, I will be on the lookout for natural tinder, natural materials, stuff growing on the trees, on the ground, on the shoreline, wherever it might be for those individual types of tinder. I will be looking for those and I'll be adopting, I think it's what Dave Canterbury calls the possum mentality, when you're just scavenging, you're just looking out for 
shiny things growing on trees to steal and take and make use of yourself, just like our ancestors did. I don't take those things with me from home because, in my opinion, there are better items available out there on the market. And everything in here is stuff that I am comfortable with the cost of. And by cost, I don't just mean financial. I mean weight, and the weight of the whole kit, packed size, how much room it takes up, and just maybe ecologically, environmentally, and what's carried in there. I'm comfortable with this at the moment. Maybe my circumstances will change and I will be less comfortable with it in the future. Your options and what you're comfortable with might be very, very different. That's completely okay. I'm showing you my kit and my mentality. Please don't take anything from this video as being, you should do this this way. If you do your thing a different way and you're happy with that, then absolutely fine. As long as you're not harming anyone else, impinging on anyone else's life and freedom, then my kit works. I know it works. Your kit probably works as well. So enough on that for now. Let's go into the kit. I have this kit, but I won't have just these items here, here in one thing that I could lose, could drop over the side of a canoe, fall out of my bag, get stolen, whatever it might be. I have several items scattered throughout my kit in different places, and there's a, sometimes there's redundancy and contingency in there, because a lot of the really essentials of fire lighting can be quite small, and can, you can carry them in lots of little places. So I've got things like my main ferro rod, that one, with a clip on it, and a bit of paracord. If you're watching this, you've probably seen one of these things, and you probably have one. That normally lives in my pocket. There's a little clip on there, so it can go on the, the belt loops, or the side of my pocket, or one of those little clips you get on some trousers. It lives in my pocket. Um, there might be something like this that lives in my PFD if I'm canoeing, or it might be in the top of my rucksack if I'm not having it in my pocket for whatever reason, but generally I've got something like this on my person at all times if I'm going somewhere where lighting a fire might mean the difference between life or death. It normally goes along with something else that's a little, little bit of a flame extender or something like that, but if I'm down to just using that, then the day's gone badly. The day's gone really badly if I'm using the tiny little ferro rod that you can buy that goes inside a Swiss Army knife like that. That's a part of my everyday carry. I have that in my pocket most days of the week. So it's not just all about this pouch. I've got stuff scattered throughout my kit. So finally, in the pouch. There's different items in here that serve different purposes. And I will go to some of them before others. And it kind of goes down in levels. If that doesn't work, then oh, the day's getting worse. I'll go to this. And if that doesn't work, oh, the day's going really badly. I'll go to this level. Um, but I'll try and go for the easy stuff first. Um, so with that in mind, that is a little butane gas lighter that I've just refilled, so it keeps overrunning. Soto brand, there's loads of these on the market. I quite like these because they have the little cap that keeps debris out of there, and you can put it on a lanyard, you can wear it around your neck. Um, that would be enough to light stoves and light fires for a week on its own. And I know people who carry just that. Um, there is always a problem with butane lighters. They can crack, you could lose the fluid from them. The little piezo igniter could die. You could drop it and lose it. So I wouldn't feel comfortable carrying just that, but that's probably, if I had to light a fire here in the next 30 minutes, I'd be going for that first because you can get, you can dry out slightly damp stuff, you could light all sorts of plastics and petrochemicals and get a fire going quickly. So, I like that one. I have a second ferro rod in here, and this, I don't know if you can pick that up on the camera, you might have to zoom in. You get my battered fingernails as well. That is a, a ferro rod that I wouldn't rely on on its own anymore because it is so thin, it's worn away in the middle. And this often happens, you don't wear them out all the way down, you wear out the middle. And it's a tiny one and it's got a whistle on it and it's fine, these light my fire ferro rods are fine. You don't need a huge thing to uh, get a good shower of sparks, but I wouldn't trust my life to just that. So if I'm using that, then it means for some reason I've lost my main one. Um, I've also got a tiny click wheel lighter, which 
has a bit of paracord on there so I can hang it from things, clip it to things, makes it slightly harder to lose. And wrapped around it, I've got some bicycle inner tube and then some more duct tape. I love the bright orange duct tape because it's easy to see. So those are my three main ignition sources, probably in that order, maybe. Butane, uh, the gas lighter, then the liquid butane lighter with a click wheel. So even if that you run out of fluid, you can still use the tiny ferro rod that's below that wheel and get a shower of sparks. And then I've got the light my fire ferro rod, which is still perfectly serviceable. Also on that side, I've got a glow stick, little Silume, just because it doesn't weigh very much. It doesn't, it will work when wet, it'll work in most conditions and it'll give me 12 hours of usable light, which means if I need to have some light to find all my little bits of kindling and things, and I've lost my head torch on my other kit, well, at least I can find light in here. And I don't have to waste fuel going around with my lighter like that, like somebody in a horror film. I've got some plastic bags in there. Uh, they are for storing the natural tinder and kindling and things that I find opportunistically when I'm out. So if I find a nice, pile of birch or something like that, I can go in there and fill one of those little bags with plastic and keep it vaguely dry, or at least when it does dry out near a fire, put it back in there and keep it dry. And that can go in inside my rucksack somewhere. Um, they don't weigh very much. They don't take much room They're in there. It's getting darker because we've got a massive storm on its way. We've just finished Storm Dudley, Dudley. And I think it's Storm Eunice is coming next. So in about 24 hours from now, we're going to be having 70, 80 mile an hour winds and heavy rain here. So, yeah, that's why we're doing this now. A few moments later. So with the rain about to hit us, let's go on to the things that will actually burn. Um, I love these things. These are the BCB Fire Dragon blocks. We have no affiliation with them other than we say nice things about them because they make a genuinely good product. Um, and when we do work with armed forces, we see these in their ration packs. These have mostly replaced the hexamine blocks in the burners now. Uh, I'll open this one up. I always end up wasting these when I do a demonstration. Um, but it's okay because that doesn't immediately evaporate away. That is a block of ethanol gel. And if you rub it on your hands, it's basically ethanol hand gel. It's the stuff that has been at every shop doorway for the last two years with the C word. So that, if I, and I'll we'll cut away in a moment to me lighting it on a block over there, uh, but that will ignite with uh, sparks from a fire steel. It will light with, spark, with any of these flames here. It will burn quite easily, but it'll also go out when you blow it. That will float, that will, you can light that and put it on a pond and it'll just float off across. Go and look for, fire dragon fuel videos on YouTube and you'll see all sorts of people doing all sorts of tests showing how amazing these are. You don't need all of that to light a fire. You can just take off a section there, a centimeter or so at the end and just use that to light a fire. And then you've got a week's worth of fire lighting there. It will evaporate a little bit, but if you put it back in there, put it inside a plastic bag, keep it away from air, then it won't evaporate away too much. It kind of oxidizes and goes to a wax on the outside. So you can reuse that. And any excess just goes on your hands, kills off some of the bacteria on your hands. So I carry a couple of those, and that's probably what I'll be using as my primary source of, uh, of ignition. Well, at least the thing I put my source of ignition to if I haven't been able to, I'm hiccuping, I haven't been able to put, get anything for that night's fire or on that fire in the trip. But I'll be trying to use natural sources before I go to these. So I carry two of those in there and I can bulk that out and add more to my kit. And I've got one of these in my first aid kit and they don't weigh very much and they're not very expensive. So I just said, we'll do a cutaway to this. We had to film it after I did the thing on the bench over there, which means we've had a rainstorm in between. So. I'm slightly wet now, but that's okay, because that means this is now real world conditions. So I've cut a small block off the uh, Fire Dragon fuel. I've got my big fat ferro rod. 
This has been sat out in the rain for a couple of minutes while we've got the camera gear set up. So this isn't going to ignite straight away. What I'll probably have to do is fire sparks at it for a little while to heat up one particular area and make it off gas enough to ignite. So if Amy pans down, let's see how many this takes to get going. But this is quite a good real world test because wet conditions, cold air, it's exactly what you'd have to deal with. And if I was doing this with my fire kit I just showed you, I'd be going to that lighter pretty quickly. There we go. So it's hard to see. And it is still raining slightly. But it's burning with an ethanol flame, so it's quite clear. But it is burning, and you can see the stump is absolutely saturated. But that's been going, that's lit just with the sparks. I think it's about to fall into the uh, hole we used when we drilled out the base for the stump for this. But that's a tiny piece, and you still have, see I've still got that much left in there. But that was suboptimal conditions. That was wet weather, cold air. It has been sat out in the rain, but that's burning quite happily now. And I would be confident in using that to get a bundle of slightly damp twigs or something going as for my first fly, fire or a piece of dead standing wood that I have battened down and made in, and carved into feather sticks or something like that. This is something I've used time and time again and it's why I carry it as my sort of primary man-made synthetic tinder um, because I know it works. And as I say, we've got no affiliation with them. It's just, they make really good kit. I bought that, I paid my own money for it. Well, it works money, but you know, same thing. I know there's no affiliate code beneath this video. Click on this link and we get 1% off everything we made you go and buy. I wish there was for that. I've got my emergency backup matches, which are those lifeboat mat strike anywhere chemical matches. If I'm using those, it's a bad day. Partly because of the amount of smoke these put out and the smell that comes from them. That'd be rain. Partly because they're a bit naff, but they come with every ration pack and I've got loads of them at home. So they live in there. And then finally that is a little pouch of bicycle inner tube, butyl rubber inner tube, which itself, you can cut strips off. It won't ignite with a fire steel, but it will ignite with either of those two lighters and it will keep burning. That's been my favorite wet weather, jungle type conditions ignition source. Um, well, flame extender really more than an ignition source. The lighter is the ignition source. Um, it means that even if I've got a fire going with other means and using natural scavenged materials, I can add a little strip of that to it to sort of guarantee my success or at least give that flame a little bit more life. And if I tear that apart, then inside I can squeeze it all out. It's always a faff to do this, it's great on camera. There's a bit of dog hair there as well from home. Pull that back into there. We're now wondering if we can get this video finished before it rains. <laughs> it rains properly because it's starting to rain quite a bit. In there, I have some other shop bought materials. I think this is the Surefire wax cotton. So that's just, it's basically cotton gauze impregnated with paraffin wax, I think. Um, but you see that in sort of commercial survival kits. And then this stuff, which is Tinder card, which is basically the same thing, except this is like blotting paper. It's like stationary blotting paper with wax in, soaked into it. And you take a piece like that and warm it between your fingers and then scruff up the edge and that'll take sparks from a fire steel. Um, we'll link a video here that is me going through all of these methods, or at least most of them. They, these will absorb water, whereas 
those ethanol blocks won't, the butyl rubber won't, but if I left these out in the rain here, they will absorb water. If I went in the river or took a swim, then these would absorb water. But by putting them inside the little pouch like that, folding the ends over, putting it in here, it's not completely submersible. You can leave it underwater for days, but you could take a short dip into a river with it and it will probably be okay. Once they dry out again, they are fine to use, but you'll probably need the fire to make them dry out, in which case you need to have a, another way of making that fire and maintaining that fire. So that's kind of my process. I've go for really easy, that will work again and again and again, but maybe is a little bit more fragile or relies on several moving parts or a container of fluid inside the lighter or a perishable resource like the uh, fire dragon blocks. Then I'll go to uh, something that's maybe a little less robust, less reliable, but will still work in most conditions if I take care of it. And then I'm down to just burning anything that will burn. But if I'm down at that level, it means that I've failed in some other way, either in my planning or my logistics, or I've lost my kit. And it shouldn't be in cases of survival and those kind of things that, all right, you plan for all of your kit getting lost and then you bravely go off and do your bow drill with your shoelaces or something like that. It's like, no, no, if you're getting to that level, it means you have screwed up royally at several different levels. It should be, ah, but what if you, use, you lose your lighter? How do you light a fire then? Well, you go into your pack and get your other lighter out, call yourself an idiot and make sure you don't lose that one. Yeah, but what if you use, lose that lighter too? Well, you really, you've got to stop making these kind of kinds of decisions, change your life a little, and then go into your first aid kit and get your backup matches. You know, that's the, that's the level it should be. There aren't many things in, the real, realistically in the outdoor world where you're suddenly gonna be dropped into the stone age and need to make fire using friction as your primary source. Because if there are, you've made some mistakes. Or you're doing combat survival and you're doing sear and you've just ejected out of an aircraft and thrown yourself into the stone age. But even then, you get that stuff in your survival kit. Then you get a ferro rod, well of a type, and you get all sorts of ignition sources. So when you think about these things realistically, there aren't many, there aren't many scenarios where the natural source of tinder is best. It doesn't stop you using that if you want to use it. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't practice those skills, and I certainly do. And knowing how to find those natural sources of tinder, where they're gonna be, what they need to be, how they need to be processed in order to make them useful, that's a vital skill. That's why we run the courses that we do, because we think those are vital skills. But don't confuse vital skills for the thing you should do first, maybe. It's properly raining now. Are we going to be able to carry on? I don't know. <laughs> All right, the last little bit. Um, I've just talked a load of crap about natural tinder and said, ah, you know, it's, it shouldn't be your first line. The only thing I'd carry, possibly, is a piece of fat wood like that because you can take shavings off it and get a lot of fire potential out of one piece of wood. It's good, but it's still, for the weight and size of that, I could carry more things in there. Um, I'd still be on the lookout for that kind of thing. Everything else in here I've brought out as examples, you know, bits of, well, that's Himalayan paper birch and that's more of a European birch and then bits of Daldinia concentrica, King Alfred's cakes. All of those things are fine, but they would be harder to get a fire going with than some of those. Or at least I would go and look for them in nature and still know I've got that as a backup, but still try and use these first because they're free. I didn't have to carry them with me. So that's it. You've got to consider how all of this fits into your other systems, your other kit. You know, if I'm going somewhere where I need to have a fire, I'll probably still also be carrying a folding saw, I'll be carrying a knife, I'll be carrying several ways of making fire, and I'll be spreading them out throughout my kit. Um, I probably wouldn't be carrying these sorts of things, where it's a, a flint and steel.
really interesting skill to learn. Interesting to make up a kit and make your own things and forge them and find out exactly what you need. But if you're down to the point where you're using that, your day has gone badly. And maybe concentrate on making sure your day doesn't go that badly. So that's it. I'm getting wet. I'm going to go and put the cameras away. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching a video that was probably longer than it should have been. Let me know in the comments below what you carry in your fire kit, where you think you'd make changes, any products I've missed out that you think are amazing, or even if you just completely disagree. If you want to go and see about our courses or book onto a course, then you can go to originaloutdoors.co.uk. Uh, we've got some social media links down below, below the video, and we've got a few other videos online and we're adding to them. We also run a couple of podcasts and we've got a podcast called Modern Outdoor Survival, where we go into these kind of things in depth but in audio form only. So they're all available online and we've started uploading them to YouTube as well. That's it. Thank you for watching. I'm going inside. Hopefully you should too as well. Or stay in the rain. I don't care. You're a fully functioning human being. Do what you want. Bye.